Okay. So Scott is a uh, Cairo and functional uh, neurologically trained Cairo. I'll let you introduce yourself or anything else I should say, Scott. Um, you can dig your own grave. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've known Scott for quite a few years now. I've had Scott come to Acnum to lecture because Scott doesn't just work on the kind of manual chiropractic side, but a lot on the nutrition side. So I've often lectured in the neuroinflammation space. Um, and clearly that's where, you know, all these connections are. So I've heard Scott speak quite a bit and I know he's always thinking super hard about um, our types of patients, you know, traumatic brain injury, uh, all that persistent neuroinflammation, spectrum conditions, etc., etc. Um, and then now also we're learning how very uh, connected to our patients in the integrative medicine space where we're dealing with mole patients, Lyme patients, Marcel, like all this stuff is going to be connected through, we already know it's connected through methylation chemistry, gut, etc. So uh, what Scott uh, is doing is just piecing together some extra bits to connect more dots and yeah, I was super excited to hear about the book. So Scott, I'll just hand to you and um, you just take it away. Okay, awesome. Well, thanks everyone for turning up. Um, quite excited, uh, a bit nervous to have uh, my, my work out here at this moment. Uh, I'm just gonna share the screen. I've uh, prepared a presentation that hopefully will, uh, for the people who wanted it recorded, will kind of have the data that I'm talking about so it's easy to refer back to while I talk and ad lib. So um, I have uh, a history in uh, functional neuro rehabilitation, uh, nutrition medicine, and um, all of it has started because of health crises with my kids who've had autism and tongue tie, fragmented sleep and a whole bunch of problems. And so everything we're about to, to talk about is what I've learned through my experiences in the last 20 years trying to make my kids the best versions of themselves uh, in comparison to where we started. So uh, tonight's presentation is Oral Airway Functional Maldevelopment Syndrome, or OFMS, as I'm trying to get into the lexicon at this moment in time. And specifically, we're going to talk about the epigenetics and uh, primitive reflex issues during pregnancy leading to tongue tie and maladaptive breathing, okay? So the, the most important points that I want you to, to kind of take away and consider from what I'm speaking about, apart from the fact that I think OFMS is a really important under uh, looked at thing because no one really talks about it, is that functionally it's a novel concept that's linking your airway and sleep fragmentation starting in babies and technically in utero to how we get to many of our metabolic diseases, brain diseases, etc., in adult life. As I said, starts in pregnancy and it continues. It's a continuum and there are discrete moments right the way through life uh, that we're all treating in our different silos. The epigenetics and pregnancy stress. So you can have either epigenetic SNPs leading to this or uh, stress in the pregnancy creating these things independent of one another and this creates offums and it creates tongue tie and it creates maladaptive breathing which continues on unless intervention occurs. So it's essentially not a single entity it's a physical physiological issue and at exactly the same time it's a developmental neurological issue that will affect cognitive outcomes it will affect your physical development your posture your pain levels but each person is independently affected some will have a bigger problem some will have less problems some will affect you know they'll go on to diabetes some will have autism some will have adhd it's going to affect all of us very differently and many of our long-term metabolic diseases, this is where I want you thinking about the continuum, that you'll be seeing. Obesity, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, muscle activation syndrome, all of the inflammatory conditions, I believe, have a root in oral airway from functional maldevelopment syndrome. Well, there are other causes for, for MCAS, obviously, uh, but there's a whole lot of stress 
that is predetermined from oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome that will drive all of these problems later on in life. Okay, so we're here to discuss the pathways that actually get tongue tie created, that actually create oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome. And I'm hopeful that we can all agree that mouth breathing, for any reason apart from sinus infection, you know, proper cough cold or running at a hard tilt is actually going to be harmful for your health. And this is especially so if you're breathing through your mouth at night. You should not be doing that for any reason. The literature is uh, frankly abundantly clear that breathing and sleep disorders are strongly associated, and again, from everything I can see, causative of cognitive decline and dementia, and especially vascular dementia. So again, we're going to be seeing vascular dementia as the major dollar spend by 2030 to 2050, 17 out of every $100 will be spent in the Western world on dementias. Now, again, if we start intervening early and get people breathing effectively, we're gonna decline a whole lot of the vascular dementia. And again, it's no secret, the literature tells us all that dementia sufferers are twice as likely to be snoring than controls. And we write off snoring as, oh, well, that's just snoring, it's a bit annoying, you know, my husband's annoying, I just wanna put a pillow over him. But it's actually a much bigger problem because it's actually hypopneas, and hypopneas damage the brain. Now again, what we also know is that sleep disorders cause disease in adults and just the alteration of sleep length, you're getting shorter amounts of sleep as well as longer, will actually positively be associated with obesity, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And again, especially for short sleep. But what's really interesting about it is that no one's really, that they're measuring the length of sleep, but they're not actually measuring how much quality of the sleep, how much fragmentation, how many times you're actually waking up. And we definitely are not doing enough to associate the lack of oxygen during that sleep. If your oxygen levels are dipping, you're in a lot of trouble and it will start creating hypoxic shedding and uh, oxygen debt into the brain, which drives oxidative stress. Okay, so sleep fragmentation is massively bad for us all. And, you know, there's different arguments about whether we're meant to be sleeping in, in two blocks or in one block and right the way through. But what we're meant to be not doing is coming up out of our sleep to defend our airway. Okay, so again, literature shows several causes of sleep fragmentation and sleep disorders. And these things create doom loops, both as a cause and as a response to your disturbed sleep. Once you start disturbing your sleep enough, you actually start driving inflammation, and this leads to disease and ill health all by its own self. But tongue ties and tongue position and posture in the mouth plays a major part because of airway occlusion and because of reflex, reflex dysfunction. If your tongue doesn't sit appropriately, it will make your system have to pull you out of your sleep because you can't not breathe. And this is an overlooked feature. We kind of just don't think effectively enough about the fact that you can't not breathe. If you stop breathing, you're dead. So the brain has to defend you against that scenario. Okay. So what I'm trying to do is just set a bit of a scene as to the importance of why mouth breathing is not so good, why nose breathing is imperative, and that these things shape and form your cranial structure, your midline structures, and the tongue is a major driver of your craniofacial well-being, okay? And all of your craniofacial well-being affects how your brain works, your spatiotopic maps, how tall you stand, how much pain your body has. It helps us develop the ability to think, okay? So again, from that point of view, oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome increases risk towards cognitive issues, mental health problems, and long-term cognitive decline from the childhood onwards. It speeds our decline, and it's so important because it's overlooked. We just accept so many things like kids snoring as normal. We just think of it as we're getting older as, oh, well, that's just normal aging. And when the kind of the specialists look at you, they go, oh, well, that's not so bad. And we, we compartmentalize rather than looking at the person as a whole. So 
Obviously, my big question for you to think about is, where does it actually start? Now, I'm alluding to it because I've already told you it starts in pregnancy. And so, of course, tongue tie and oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome, mouth breathing issues and other health issues start in the pregnancy. And potentially, you could argue it starts in the two years prior to the pregnancy actually kicking off. So again, some of you may have heard of the Barker hypothesis. This is a, um, a phenomenon that changed how I view health and well-being. And I believe the Barker hypothesis describes a lot of our epigenetic plasticity and it allows alteration to human health and function long-term. So. The Barker hypothesis is basically often called uh, the, the thrifty gene hypothesis as well. And it basically says that kind of distress to the mother, uh, such as malnourishment or you know danger, can alter the scenario of how the children are created in the womb. And basically it's been shown that many chronic disorders, including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, stroke risk, etc., will manifest later on in life. Uh, obesity is strongly linked to this. And the major factor that's actually showing up and is, is being considered the, the number one cause of you know, Barker hypothesis outcomes is actually poverty. And poverty creates stress and stress creates uh, problems in, in mothers, driving malnourished mothers, and they give birth to functionally malnourished infants that have low birth weight. Now, ultimately, these factors have all gone on to contribute to developmental plasticity of both the brain and the body, and it's able to change the genotype, and it's able to change uh, the child's long-term behaviors in response to the environmental conditioning of what was going on in the mother and mother's environment when she was pregnant with the child. Now, in honesty, what the data actually shows is that the Barker hypothesis will affect, so if you have a bad pregnancy, lots of stress, low nourishment, it will affect your children's outcome down to the third generation. So your great grandchildren will be affected by the stress in your pregnancy. So no pressure there. So what that fundamentally says though is that living things are infinitely plastic in early development. So the environment that they grow in shapes them. There's no great surprise to that, okay? Now, ultimately though, by adapting to a limited supply of nutrients, the fetus actually appears to prioritize the brain's development over the body's development. It prioritizes over things like kidney mass, pancreatic tissue, and connective tissue development. And that's a really important one. So fetal programming causes adaptations to the insufficient maternal environment. So the mother system is not feeding enough nutrients to the child and we get poor uh, capillary bed uh, invigilation so that there's not enough supply to the baby and we get therefore poorer outcomes for the child at that moment in time persistent impacts on their structure, their physiology, their metabolism, and their neurocognitive development. Now again, all of these things, as we'll get to, show developmental adaptations and illnesses in the midline structures, tongue, sinuses, eye structure, and the cranium itself. Now, ultimately, this is causing developmental adaptations and subsequent illness including tongue tie, tongue posture, lack of use of it, and we get problems uh, with the actual brain sitting in the skull uh, because as the face shape changes, you're actually changing the cranial base that the brain is sitting in and can actually, the, the physical shape of the skull actually changes some of the developmental characteristics. It changes the angles of which the nerves are going to develop around in the skull. Now, again, function drives form, and the, the whole beginning of these things starts really early on. So again, the fetus is actually starting generally, in most children, to move the tongue at about 12, 12 and a half weeks of gestation. And by about 18 weeks, the fetus should have a properly developed swallow mechanism or some form of swallow mechanism. And that's an important point because, again, it's a thrive or die mechanism. So if you can't use your tongue postpartum, 
you are unlikely to be able to feed and therefore you will likely die. So the, the fetus is going to develop some form of tongue mechanism. If the movement's not normal, and this could be due to tethering or restriction in the fascia in around the tongue and the oral mucosa, then the child will start to develop compensatory mechanisms, meaning that it will be aberrant from what is expected. Now, again, think about how early on the tongue is developing. It starts very early. It starts at about six weeks, and we'll get to that. This is, is again, the tongue is not just a physical thing. It's a neurological first sensory tool. It's our first sensory organ. It's our first motor organ. It's how we start experiencing the world. So if there's aberration in that first six to 12 to 18 weeks of life, it affects everything that's going on for the child. The infant, therefore, because it's so early in the beginning of the, the pregnancy of your life, if you're not using it properly, you've got lots of time to maladapt the wiring of that mechanism into your brain, into your central nervous system. And, and functionally, this is of course all occurring before we've even got to the breastfeeding. So lots of the problems that occur postpartum with breastfeeding has actually been wiring for about 20 something weeks before they actually come out. So therefore you have to understand that much of what occurs with breastfeeding, if abnormal, is an abnormal compensatory mechanism because of the thrive or die aspect of it. So again, think about difficulty latching, the chomping, mothers getting sore nipples, mastitis, etc. All of this, however, leads not only to difficulty with feeding and the dyad, but it also creates alteration in the movement of the face of their muscles, of the jaw muscles and the cranium because all the, the cranial muscles that open and close the jaw, the closing of it all attaches right through the sides of the skull, through the parietotemporal temporal bones and it pulls on it and it creates the, the sutures to actually start moving. The tongue is pushing up into the roof of the mouth and driving the splaying of the structure of the roof of the mouth. So if you're not getting your tongue into the right spot, we're gonna alter your craniofacial development. Now, again, a first time mother will not know if the child is having real difficulty to start with. They're not going to know uh, if it's less efficient because again, they didn't observe in the right way because you can't, the child's development is not going perfectly in the pregnancy. They haven't done a perfect latch before so they take on board these things as perfectly normal and oftentimes we don't intervene if there is major trouble for a long time. Thus, not only did we have kind of 20 weeks of abnormal aberrant trajectory in pregnancy, but it can also be another kind of three, six, 12 months potentially before someone determines that we actually need to intervene after birth. And in my kid's case, it took like my youngest was 14 before I found the tongue tie. Now, Ultimately, compensatory movements and use lead to changes in how the child actually experiences and interacts with the world. And this causes symptoms. So they develop problems such as failure to thrive, oral sensitivity, uh, positing and vomiting, drooling, picky eating. Uh, speech and language can be kind of developed later on because if you can't get your tongue into the right spot, you can't talk properly. And so I'm, I'm obviously exaggerating, but that's exactly what goes on. If you have tethering, your tongue will not develop strength to stay in the right spot. But tongue tie and oral position will drive fragmented sleep and it will ultimately end up, as is so common, with a lot of orthodontic issues. And we see this everywhere in the Western world. I mean, it's kind of like a rite of passage for kids to be going to the orthodontist these days. Now again, I'm using the term normal to describe what we'd optimally kind of hope was going on and the expected type of development that's meant to be kind of similar in all of us. Now, there's no such thing as absolutely normal because everyone develops slightly differently, but that's kind of the, the simple idea. And what we're meant to be doing is activating the facial muscles in uh, a regular symmetrical movement pattern, including the lips and tongue. And this is meant to lead to normal orofacial movement, and again, the major thing that we're meant to be learning to do to start with is the suck, swallow, breathe reflex, which then leads on to normal cranial motion and structural growth. A lack of movement or 
poor movement causes altered growth patterns and underdevelopment of the jaws, a lack of tone in the face. And again, you see these in the kids. They're dribbling a lot. They have kind of low tone uh, in the lips, lips open, pulled up lips, breathing through the mouth. As I said, snoring. In the most extreme cases, we tend to recognize as plagiocephaly. Now, again, by 32 weeks, the suck, swallow, breathe reflex is in action. Uh, this is, of course, before uh, birth and is essential for the normal breastfeeding to occur. So if there's compensation, we're gonna have some problem. Now, again, given that function drives form, an alteration in this reflex contributes to the skull changing its shape after birth. Remember, thrive or die. So again, from my point of view, it can't be overstated how important normal motion is for the brain and cognitive development. And these things are actually led by what are called primitive reflexes that are actually hardwired reflexogenic capacities built into the brain stem and the spinal cord. And functionally, research shows that if you can't make a specific motor pattern on your face, you can't actually understand the emotion particularly easily. So that, I'm bringing this up because if we have problems with tongue position, face weakness, you're not going to be able to mimic those people around you. And so again, it's really worth considering therefore the concept of children with low tone or restriction of their facial muscles, buckle ties, lip ties, etc., top and bottom, and the difficulty that those children have trying to develop emotional maturity and whether they actually need the labels that we often diagnose them with on the spectrum, et cetera, that it may actually be a neurophysiological problem that needs rehab in a very different way rather than kind of the world being changed to make them function better. If your facial structures are aberrant, too narrow, poor tone, poor use, how do you mimic the expressions of those people and reinforce those learned pathways into your brain because the activation of your facial muscles to mimic an expression sets up the connections to the areas in the brain and therefore those kids are going to have an alteration in their neuroemotional behavior because that's their normal okay so much of the functional re research that I, I found is that's actually leading to a lot of these problems is, is functionally done in labs and on animal models. And we've had to extrapolate it to people because you're not really allowed to do these experiments. It's sort of against the uh, Geneva Conventions and things like that. So they use a lot of zebrafish in, in these experiments. And what they've shown is that those experiments on the zebrafish cerebrospinal fluid uh, when they alter the flow in, in the, the skull and the spine, it actually um, alters and affects how the embryo's face develops, and it's actually shown to cause uh, postural alteration and scoliosis. So if you slow the amount of cerebrospinal fluid movement, you actually create twists in the, in, in the spine and alteration of position of the, the cheekbones of the length of the face. Now, cerebrospinal fluid movement contributes to long-term healthy outcomes in the adult animal. They deduced that a lot of this, the, the, the reason that they could induce the alterations was actually due to retinoic acid binding protein or retinoic acid carrying proteins, so RAR. And this functionally carries vitamin A around the CFCF and is associated with the alteration of flow in the embryonic cell survivals. So what, what they then went on to basically say is that low maternal vitamin A may actually have a negative impact on skeletal development during the pregnancy. And they also note that excessive amounts of free retinoic acid, so if you don't have the right level of retinoic acid binding protein in the, the system in the cerebrospinal fluid, you can't carry the vitamin A around and the vitamin A becomes toxic. Now this scenario leads to bone resorption in the offspring and structural fragility, which is again what we're seeing in our, in our teenagers especially. They have narrow, soft faces and we're all busily blaming that they're not chewing effectively, but this stuff starts way before then. So work actually done by Kennedy and Dickinson uh, back 11 years ago, uh, revealed that inhibition of the retinoic acid signaling during 
facial specification, which is around six weeks during the pregnancy in humans, results in median cleft, so uh, cleft palate, hair lip, etc., in the primary palate related to tongue tie. So the, the areas that that was occurring uh, are the areas that drive tongue tie in, in us. So RAR inhibition resulted functionally in reduced intercanthal distance, so we got narrowing in, in the bite structure, reflecting a narrower mid-face, which again will cause difficulty in airway breathing and increased face length. And this is kind of called an adenoidal face. Now, changing that the brain position. So if you get narrower here, you are going to get an alteration in the movement in the back part because the skull is, this part connects right the way through and if we narrow the front end, we actually tend to get an alteration in the backside of the skull, um, altering how you're able to breathe, how you're able to drain fluid around the brain, and we tend to get uh, children with outcomes of upper airway resistance syndrome. Now again, I think this is pretty exciting stuff. Other people may not find it quite so thrilling, but it functionally was showing, this is the first evidence that I was coming across to show that nutrient and single nucleotide polymorphism specifically had critical effects on the development and things that, that are actually quite easy to alter in our diet. So, so we can actually make sure that people have the right levels of um, retinoic acid and um, vitamin A going in. We can actually check whether people have SNPs for retinoic acid binding protein. It's part of a lot of commercial panels these days. So ultimately, again, this raises a bunch of questions about nutritional screening in young women before pregnancy uh, and food fortification and whether this drive, so there's a big drive out there as I'm sure we've all kind of heard about to consume vast amounts of plant-based uh, everything. So plant-based beta carotene is, is all the rave versus higher amounts of like liver consumption and, and animal-based protein, which has animal-based vitamin A, which is what the body actually uses. You don't ever use the, the plant-based beta carotene. You have to convert it. So is this really particularly positive for us? And are we actually maldeveloping our, uh, our children because of this? Um, so I, I think that's an important uh, set of questions that we should be looking at. Now, this work demonstrates obviously that there's a bunch of structural alterations in our offspring's cranial structure that affects their outcomes as they continue to grow. Because again, if you've got weak structure, poor cartilaginous development and poor ossification centers in the midline of your face, you're going to get a narrow face. And that is the most common pattern that's actually out there these days. Now, further epigenetic studies on gene expression and function modifications without DNA sequence alteration. So again, we're not talking genomic changes, we're talking normally expected SNPs at that moment in time, creating a bunch of these tongue tie and facial developmental issues. Now, the environment, food, and genetic abnormalities obviously can affect these things. And we're looking at it from the point of view of the gene silencing an outcome. So epigenetics obviously can change protein structure. They can speed things up, slow things down. And again, that's alterable. We can do stuff about it. We can make measurements before people go into pregnancies to try and harmonize their nutritional aspects. Again, epigenetic changes as against a genetic change are involved in the development of tongue tie. Alteration and in the promoter region of a gene called transforming growth factor beta-3, TGF beta-3, uh, plays a major role in the development of tongue tie. Now this gene uh, formed a cytokine as its outcome, which is involved in cell differentiation, embryogenesis, and facial development especially. And variance in the gene actually causes more fibrous tissue growth, and it creates a lack of apoptosis during specific phases of development. Now again, this is a pathway potentially creating greater amounts of tension and alteration of the lingual frenulum at the front, as well as in the posterior uh, fascia. So we've got two mechanisms towards oral airway dysfunction. You've got the tongue being tethered because you're not chewing up and getting rid of the excess fibrous tissue, as well as weakness in the fibrocartilage in the face. Now, 
everyone I'm hoping has heard of MTHFR. I kind of look at it as it's given quite a, a mythical uh, level in the integrative field. But MTHFR is an enzyme that, again, is playing a big role in tongue tie. It obviously is uh, a major component in the metabolism of folate and thymidine, uh, which are big group vitamins, and they're important for a bunch of bodily functions. Again, energy production, neurotransmitter development, cartilaginous production, and that's an important one, and a whole bunch more, and I'm not here to belabor that, just to talk about the SNPs associated with the midline structures. Now, MTHFR SNPs are linked in a variety of health issues, including their increased risk of birth abnormalities. Everyone kind of thinks about, uh, you know, spina bifida, but it also causes cardiovascular disease and issues where it can increase the risk of certain types of cancers. But the SNP modified the speed and the efficiency of our protein outcomes and the product actions in those methylation cycles. And this isn't just because of MTHFR. MTHFR could be working perfectly, but if we have issues with say B12, FUT2, MTR, MTRR, or a lack of say B3 and magnesium, we might not have so much good methylation going on. Everything has to be present in sufficient numbers to maintain all of the loops in cyclic balance. Remember, methylation and again, in fact, most metabolic activities in the body actually require what I call a Goldilocks moment. The enzyme speed and efficiency has to be just right to avoid a harmful byproduct to build up or cycle disruption. Tissue production can be blockaded if we've got no uh, 5 prime MTHF or too little B12 because we get stuck. And this will cause the fetus to maldevelop. We're gonna deviate away from the normal production level. And again, this is occurring at five to six weeks gestation. So again, studies have found increased prevalence in MTHFR gene mutations in people with tongue tie and oral fascia. Um, they've got restrictions through the midline. It's also associated with hernias and um, pterodactyly, especially of the toes. Unfortunately, we don't have an exact link. It's not fully understood, but I'm hoping people would keep kind of bringing that to light. Further to MTHFR, we've got DHFR, which is also involved, uh, and dihydrofolate reductase, along with MTHFR and folic acid. Now again, the literature uses the term folic acid as against folate. So I'm using it because that's where I took it from. I don't agree with folic acid being here, but that's just the way it is. So these things have been implicated in the development of ankyloglossia. So DHFR and MTHFR are the enzymes that are obviously part of the conversion of folate found in food to the active version that the body is actually going to use to make neurotransmitters and tissue. The body uses these end products to drive facial development, tongue development, uh, cartilaginous structures through the cheeks and midlines at five to six weeks of pregnancy. Now I'm harping on about that point because I need you to understand that all of this is occurring right at the point before some people are even aware that they're pregnant. So things can be going aberrant without our knowledge. So that's just the map for interest sake. So a paper by Amity, fundamentally on preconception care and folic acid. They basically found it was hypothesized that too much folic acid is problematic for normal development of the fetus, leading to tighter midline structures, including the tongue fascia, and that this could be the cause of ankyloglossia. Most people here, as I said, should know that folic acid does not operate the same way as folate and can create blockade, leading to a lack of MTHF being produced, creating undermethylation and potentially metabolic imbalance. Thus, overuse of folic acid in rich pregnancy supplements, while well-meaning, may actually be doing harm to our offspring. Now, again, I don't agree with uh, their approach. I don't agree with supplementation of folic acid over folate or active folate. And there's a bunch of other research that I've looked at that kind of questions a whole bunch of the validity. But I think it's important in that the, their findings are showing that if we disturb the gene expression, if we create blockade in the methylation loops, we're actually um, 
altering long-term development. And this is due to teratological input at critical developmental phase. So if you get past that six week mark before you start running into methylation problems, we don't get the same degree of negative outcome in the midline structures. We don't get as much narrowing of the face or uh, tension in the oral fascia. Now, I believe changing methylation can affect cranial growth, ossification and breathing after birth, which also will affect the emotional control and the neurological development of the child ongoing. Now, again, changes to the nasal structure, the sinuses, palate length, jaw rami, the tongue posture and position affect your ability to breathe through the nose. If you split your lips apart, you will start breathing through your mouth. So keeping your lips together is really important. If you have maldevelopment and overbite and underbite, etc., uh, or tight tethering of the upper lip, you're going to be more inclined to breathe through your mouth. And this is shown to create acidification of the blood, alter calcification, uh, strip um, calcium out of your bone structures. It does a whole bunch of really negative things to you. Um, so again, the, the posture affects your ability to breathe. It creates a narrow airway and it can have significant immunological effects, especially if you're living in an environment where there's a lot of dust, debris, mold, etc. If you breathe through your mouth, you are skipping all of the upper airway for cleaning, humidification, the adenoids, and only leaving the tonsils to do the job, which is not a very efficient thing. So change to the tongue posture and function impedes the growth of the bones that they contact with as well. So again, if the tongue is sitting down, you are not splaying up into the facial uh, structure to actually drive the normal arch development. Again, Kennedy and Dickinson were quite big in this area. And again, they found that the DHFR shortage during the early head and facial development at six to 12 weeks of pregnancy induced a narrower midline and deformed mouth shape. So much higher arches with more buck teeth, more cross teeth, more overjet. Again, the adenoidal face with poorer breathing outcomes. Um, deformed mouth shape, jaw muscle was weaker and they had cartilaginous loss across uh, the maxilla and the nasium. Now this is consistent with reports uh, of effect in mammals where folate deficiency or mutation to those major pathways uh, were as a result, they had craniofacial deficits and uh, smaller head size. So it's not just this group looking at it, there's a bunch of people confirming this information. Folate and its active components are needed for efficient apoptosis. Now, if you don't have enough methylation going on, you can't actually chisel out the excess fascia and it stays and it restricts how the tongue moves. Hence, any loss of folate metabolism will alter craniofacial development, resulting in smaller face, smaller jaw development, poorer breathing, and difficulty potentially with sleep. Now, vertebrates with folate metabolism abnormalities are shown to have increased apoptosis uh, during development. So what occurs at that moment is that you actually chew through a lot of that cartilage instead of chewing through the extra fascia. DNA damage will also contribute to DHFR inhibition induced apoptosis. So again, problems with folate uh, metabolism can lead to thymidine problems, which can lead to problems with DNA leading to this cycle. It's a doom loop. Again, interestingly, it appears that DNA damage could be a conserved effect of DHFR deficiency. Uh, Brooklyn found that children with folic acid, and again their words, uh, the deficiencies have increased levels of DNA damage in the cells in the palate, supporting this thought process. So DHFR deficient cells were actually localized to regions of the face, and again, the regions of the face are uh, cheekbones, midline, uh, the roof of the mouth. And uh, what they basically found is that there were geometric morphometric uh, changes. And functionally, that's a fancy way to say that they measured the face shape and found that the cellular structure in kids was different from a normal expected outcome. Now, in addition, developmental genes important for all of the muscle uh, development and differentiation and cartilage differentiation, such as 
the RERs that we spoke about before, as well as fibroblast growth factor and wingless related integration site are actually expressed strongly in these midline mid face regions where there is meant to be an abundance of these apoptotic cells. So if you damage those cells, you actually damage more than just the DHFR genes. You damage all of the genes that are essential for hardening and ossifying the face and strengthening the bone structure so it's wide and uh, strong as against narrow and long. Defects in folic metabolism during facial development actually result in significant loss of these cells expressing the genes, including WNTS and FGFS, which are actually particularly essential for your facial structure. And this profoundly affects your outcomes. You get a very different shape of head with, again, if you do this to someone's face, you cannot breathe through the nose particularly effectively. You get this upper airway uh, restriction of airflow, which creates a whole bunch of different stresses, including immunological. And again, this is occurring in the fetus. It then continues on to create uh, maldevelopment of the face in the children after birth and all of the ongoing consequences that we're all seeing, that we're all treating at different stages. You end up with the kids at four at the, the dentist's office having crowns put on their back teeth. They end up at the speech language therapist at like five, six, seven years of age, the orthodontist at 12, chiropractors, osteopaths, physios, etc. as you continue on. So again, other epigenetic changes have been linked to, to tongue tie, and this includes a bunch of DNA methylation issues, RNA binding protein changes, and histone modifications. Now, again, they don't really know exactly what the mechanism of these things are, uh, but there are some ideas, especially around the histone modification, uh, that it could be basically because if the, the histone's misshapen due to modification, uh, we basically misread uh, the data of that, that, that SNP, that gene, and we get a misfolded protein coming out the other end. So it doesn't have the same shape. It doesn't make the lock and key mechanism that we're actually meant to have for things to work efficiently. It's the wrong three dimensional shape at that moment in time. Now, again, it may be too rigid, or it may be too floppy, depending on what the outcome of how that misread has actually gone on. However, if the histone is misshapen due to those modifications and inappropriate methyl tagging of the DNA, the gene can't read it out. So the sequence is wrong one way or the other, and this leads to the protein structure being misfolded. The structure that they used to create is therefore dysfunctional as a result. The bonds don't pull in the right place because they're all uh, ionically bonded to actually haul itself together and hold the structure. And therefore three-dimensional shape doesn't hold and we get bunches of problems at them. Okay, so ultimately, again, we've spoken a bit about these epigenetic changes. There are a bunch of other things that could be going on, which we're gonna move on to. Epigenetic changes, MTHFR, et cetera, are just one of the factors that I'm looking at that's creating oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome. Just frank energy protein malnourishment can wreck things. Nutritional deficiencies can wreck things. So these things alone, folic acid deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, iron deficiency is a massive one. So if you have iron deficiency, you're not going to be sending enough oxygenated blood around the system to actually nourish the, the placenta alone. And that will lead to problems with the off, offspring's outcomes. Protein deficiency. Everything that we are is made from protein. So if you have protein uh, malnourishment in the mother prior or during pregnancy, it's going to create maxillary hyperplasia uh, as we go on. Again, narrow palate, consequences. So the tongue is a crucial part of the body. Its neuromuscular system is massively intertwined with the brain. So again, as I said before, it is your first sensory and motor organ, and it has a large amount of uh, neural connection to the brain stem, to the cerebellum, and has links up into your soothing mechanisms. It's also tied in through the vagus nerve to the digestive tract and a bunch of other stuff, as well as the spine, the neck, your teeth, and it helps in relationship to spatial awareness, sound, the localization, and again, your capacity to emotionally respond in appropriate fashions. So issues with your tongue 
if it starts early enough, can alter how you view the world. Narrow palates, commonly called maxillary hyperplasia, again, refers to the condition where the roof of the mouth generally uh, is too narrow for the tongue to fit in and it tends to push it down. And depending on where the tethering is, it can pull it back. A narrow palate can lead to a range of health problems, including breathing problems, no great surprise, dental issues, speech language delays, and eating difficulties. Again, narrow palate and, and malposition of the tongue commonly are associated with the neurological quirks, such as picky eating, li not liking certain tastes, textures, etc. that we just kind of go, oh, well, that's kids. Well, it might be because their mouth is actually stressed and maldeveloped. And if you're a stressed infant without really great cognitive function, you're gonna look at everything as if it's a threat to you, and therefore, if it's odd, I don't want to put it in my mouth. It also leads to social and emotional issues, and again, these people have a greater difficulty participating in, in social connection, activities, sports, etc. Um, again, a lot of them aren't as fit because they can't breathe as effectively. So again, I think it's something we need to be considering. Um, what we're looking at here, these are the, the major sites where the clefts and the, the ties start occurring. Uh, lip ties, as I said, buckle ties, roof clefts, and this is the area that we're going to get alteration uh, in, in the structure. Um, midline structures especially are particularly important for the role of the mesopanaletine suture, which are right through the middle. Uh, and this affects the nasomaxillary complex because again, it sits right underneath your nose. So if we get narrowing in this area or foreshortening or, or bucking, it will change the width of your sinuses of your nasomaxillary uh, growth. And again, I, I cannot overstate how important having a wider shaped mouth lower arch rather than a gothic shaped arch is for our normal function. And deviation of cartilaginous cell migration to this region alters the complex ossification process. So there's a bunch of stuff that goes into it, obviously, as we just spoke about those genes. If you don't have those cells migrating at five to six weeks in the pregnancy, you don't have anything to ossify to harden into a nice, strong facial structure in the first place. And this, again, is gonna to lead to long-term alteration in your growth. Um, again, I want you to kind of give consideration to our, our bony development. The skull is gonna develop in three, dimensions, it kind of grows down and forward in a three-dimensional structure. We're born with a big head and little faces. I call it the anime babe face. And you can see when people are going wrong because they have big foreheads, kind of moderate sized mid face, and they've got these little chins and jaws. And again, that's kind of that Japanese style of anime and manga cartooning. And we have lots of people kind of running around looking cutesy that way, but they can't chew to save themselves particularly. So mammalian skull bones develop from cranial neural crest cells and paraxial mesoderm. And these things ossify intramembranetically. Now this fundamentally means that there's uh, two different forms of tissue that forms a skull uh, and they ossify in very different fashions. Uh, the cranial bones, which actually cover the big part, are actually generated from supraorbital arch mesenchyme. And the supraorbital arch is the main site of ossification for the frontal and parietal bones. However, all of this, what's happening up here, is driven by what's happening through the cranial base. And the cranial base is very flexible because it's got all of the, the nerves coming through it for the cranial nerves, a whole bunch of arterial supply going through it. And it has to be able to flex to actually get you born in the first place. So if that then doesn't ossify appropriately, if it gets distorted in that very early phase soon after birth, it will harden in the wrong position. Cranial neural crest cells migrate superficially. So again, they, they come to the top, unlike trunk neural crest cells. And those things go deep and they form your organs, your heart, your lungs, etc. Cranial neural crest cells differentiate into your osteoblasts, chondrocytes, and other cell types, unlike trunk neural crest cells. So again, the, the trunk neural crest cells go into organs, the cranial ones 
are making the things that are meant to harden in your face and they're the ones that tend to have the struggle if we have uh, SNPs to things like MTHFR and RAR. Um, again, I've gone on to talk a little bit about hyaline cartilage. Chondrocranium develops in the second month of gestation. So again, six, eight, nine, 12 weeks. And it's functionally very reliant on nutritional availability of the mother's environment. And it's not genetics. So if there's a problem, it's an epigenetic problem and the body will try and adapt to grow the best child. If the mum is deficient in bone development nutrients, again, think vitamin A, folate D, K2, protein, um, there's going to be an inhibition in cranial base growth. The facial structure will therefore alter and the midline structures will also create structural issues. Again, tongue, cranial base, maxilla. And again, that is just after creation, which starts at five to six weeks and before a whole bunch of neurological development has actually occurred. Now, the nutritional supply is deeply affected by the activation of a primitive reflex, the very first one that develops called the fear paralysis reflex, okay? And the fear paralysis reflex actually petitions the nutrients and the blood supply and resources towards mum when her environment is threatening to her. And this is to enhance mother's survival and therefore mother and child survival. And think about it, if the bear jumps out of the woods and threatens mum and it catches her, both of you are dead, right? So it's a really sensible system to take stress off the mum from the baby so that all of the, the um, resources are there to actually uh, help mum survive. And functionally what's meant to occur is like 15 minutes later, once you've run away from the bear, as if, um, the, the reflex should turn off and the, the nutrient supply goes back to the baby after the immediate danger is, has gone. Now, again, what I want you to think about here is that we don't live in that world. We don't live in 15 minute stress responses. We live in chronic threat environments. And I want you to think about the epidemic of chronic anxiety, the massive amounts of EMF in our environment, mortgage stress, air pollution, domestic abuse, etc. All of these things are capable of chronically and repetitively activating the fear paralysis reflex, again, diverting blood supply away from uh, the child towards the mother's system, malnourishing the end outcome of the infant. The end result is malnourishment, maldevelopment, and imprinting on the epigenome far away from the optimal in the child. Now, that does not require mum to have any SNPs. She can have a perfect genome, perfect epigenetic, but she's living in a shitty environment, mold in the environment, lots of bad food, poverty, etc and it will create restriction and imprinting on the child's genome, creating SNPs. Now, of special interest is the exposure of the maternal environment to chemicals, which can activate the fear paralysis reflex and cause blood supply partitioning. So again, these chemicals are shown to go through the maternal placental membrane and alter the, the, the child in potentially bad ways, things that we don't want. Now again, common ones out there, Things like methotrexate can have very far-reaching consequences. It's also known to inhibit folate. Now, another really interesting one is this, this current craze of the electric cigarettes and vaping. And the chemicals that are in that are not so good, including nicotine, but also artificial flavors such as vanillin. And those are shown to inhibit the retinoic acid receptor, the RAR that we were talking, and they act as an antagonist, and this alters the midline structure of the cartilaginous cells, creating alteration in your ability to harden your face. So again, candy bar, you know, we, we flavor our foods with these things or that quick hit of, you know, I'm not smoking, I'm vaping, it's much safer, that you actually thought was safe may actually potentially trigger unforeseen consequences well before you might even realize you're actually pregnant. So the next fun area that we get to is, of course, the Australian government is meant to be really, really helpful to us, and it tracks our nutritional statuses for a bunch of things, including folate. But we don't track your vitamin A levels. Now, again, the next fun thing is that the data that you can get a hold of in my position is about 10 years out of date, 
and looking at it, it's really interesting how they interpret things because the Australian government believes that, that women of childbearing age all functionally have adequate folate levels. Very few people have inadequate folate levels uh, that would be creating problems. They say literally less than 1% of women aged 16 to 44 years of age have red cell folate levels in the at-risk range for neural tube development disorders. So. I took some umbrage with that and I didn't think that was uh, particularly accurate considering a bunch of things that we know about. Now, I want you to look at it from what we've just been talking about. We know uh, when we look at the literature that there's a whole bunch of people with tongue tie being born, which we know is associated with folate problems. We also know uh, that there is a lot of people being born that go on to develop class one, two and three uh, malocclusions. And so I put some of the, the data there, but functionally what we know is that ankyloglossia rates about 5% and there's been a minimum of 12% structural shift in facial developments that actually require orthodontics uh, since 1999. Now again, at a very basic level, we know categorically that those things are associated, because the literature says so, with problems with methylation and vitamin A. Uh, and we've got a big amount of them, which is significantly more than the 1%. So perhaps childbearing women having folate deficiency needs to be reconsidered in Australia and we need to be doing something more effective about it. So my favorite big area, the fear paralysis reflex, I think I, I wanted to emphasize this a little bit more because it's, it's the first reflex that actually appears neurologically in the growing fetus. The fear paralysis reflex sets the stage for every other reflex, every other primitive reflex and all neurological development to occur. And this is what I'm trying to get to, that it, tongue tie and, and oral facial maldevelopment is not just a physical thing. It's going to affect how the nervous system wires itself up. And it starts as the fear paralysis reflex does at five to six weeks, because FPR starts at about six weeks at exactly the same time as the tongue starts to develop and it strongly wires into this area as we'll see. Now if the FPR is retained, it's actually associated with major amounts of emotional regulation issues, ocular disturbances, vestibular disturbances, and again, midline muscle and fascial problems as well as oral dysfunction because it upsets or is capable of upsetting the suck, swallow, breathe reflex starting in the newborn and it continues to create problems. FBR starts five to seven weeks in utero. As I said, exactly the same time as the tongue and the oral structures are developing integratedly. You cannot actually separate one from the other because as the cells come into the same spot and migrate, they make the nervous system and the tongue and the face all at the same time. And so of course, from my point of view, I look at it and go, well, what? What starts this dysfunction? Is there a unifying teratological issue? Is it methotrexate or you know some weird and wonderful thing? Is it the amount of PFAS that's in the environment that's actually creating this great increase in uh, oral dysfunction that we're actually seeing, altering the nervous system, altering the, the face from such an early point in pregnancy? Now, the fear paralysis reflex developmentally is followed on, it develops into theoretically the moral reflex, which you should have all have heard of. The moral reflex appears again around nine to 12 weeks in utero. And this presumes, of course, that the fear paralysis went away, that you integrated it and the brain developed to not need it, okay? Reflexes will not go away if there is still an environmental reason for it to be there, such as mum, being in a stressful environment, too much EMF activating, malnourishment, all of these things can interfere with the reflexes going through their normal tango through the cycle. And research also shows that the fear paralysis reflex never fully leaves us, but it actually develops into a reflex that actually controls your airway in REM sleep, which is kind of interesting. So the FPR should not, I categorically say, should not remain active. It should develop into sleep REM control and the moral reflex. It shouldn't stay there. And again, if the moral reflex is still there after birth, uh, after the appropriate integration phase, this could mean that the FPR was not extinguished as well. So it's a really good way of double checking whether the system's wired itself up normally. 
Okay, so any disruption of EPR moro reflexes risks adversely affecting all of the rest of the integration of your primitive reflexes. If they stay there, they will stop you being able to fully integrate most of your other reflexes. Now, we've spent the longest period of time just assuming that as you got to adulthood, your brain must be a fully developed thing uh, and that you didn't have any reflexes. And if they started to come out, that was uh, a frontal slippage sign that your your in frontal demise. And this does not appear to be the case. The literature shows that plenty of nine-year-olds, the average is that they have 6.4 retained primitive reflexes at nine years of age in some of the literature I've looked at. Now this ultimately is gonna to lead to a bunch of physical, mental, and emotional challenges for them that will continue on if they are not rehabilitated. And these things can include OCD, anxiety, poor emotional attachment, oral texture hypersensitivity, inability to cuddle, vestibular issues such as fear of heights. There's huge amounts of them. Again, FPR and its integration is essential for all of our later tertiary level emotions and relationships to actually develop. It plays a protective role for both mother and child, as I mentioned, and it performs the essential protective task of reducing the demand of the fetus from what it's placing on the mum's system in those fight flight scenarios. This causes the fetus to actually experience an immediate motor paralysis, restric restricted peripheral blood flow and lowered heart rate. Sounds like POTS. Um, mother has all of her resources available to respond to the, the circumstance and simultaneously, the FPR is also protecting the fetus by decreasing exposure and absorption into the fetus of stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, you know, dopamine, all of those things, which we probably don't want so much that are pumping around the mum system in response to the threat. So it's a really useful thing, but if it's chronically overactivated and it goes on and on and on, that's not so good for the developing child. So if the growing fetus is threatened by toxic substances in the mum's bloodstream, such as alcohol, which is hopefully being discouraged, but it still goes on, the fear paralysis reflex will actually activate and reduce the fetus's absorption of these things. Now, as a result, it can have, the fear paralysis reflex is an autonomic response and ties strongly into the autonomic system. Um, and it affects a, a whole bunch of things in response to both physical as well as psychological stimuli. So you can trigger it by emotional states. So consider the effects of a mum who's chronically anxious throughout a pregnancy on what's gonna to happen to the fear paralysis activation and whether it's going to potentially change the infant's nourishment and development. Again, I think it's gonna massively affect them both physically and cognitively, and we need to be doing stuff about this. It's fantastically likely that the child's threat set point after birth is going to be altered to a much higher response state if mum's been activating fear paralysis right the way through um, due to its epigenomic imprinting, nutritional pathway, petitioning, etc. So again, we're going to go back to the, the mouse and zebrafish models. Ethanol in these experiments in the bloodstream, comparable to binge drinking that we would do as adults has been shown to disrupt skeletal development and cause scoliosis and cleft palate in both the zebrafish and the mouth. Now this raises again interesting concepts concerning the essential timing, as I was talking about teratological toxic issues of dose and timing in the development of the child. So again, lots of people at four or five weeks may not know that they're pregnant and went out with their friends and we get an amount of alcohol. And everyone kind of worries about fetal alcohol syndrome. I'm just suggesting that the right dose at the wrong moment can structurally alter how your face, your tongue develops, how your airway works, and whether you can breathe properly at night. Perhaps earlier or lower doses cause sub-levels of maldevelopment that will actually affect skeletal results and how the child's central nervous system will continue to wire itself up. Again, what I think we need to be having is society level debates on uh, whether people should be having free access to alcohol at some of these moments in time. Now, I'm gonna come off sounding terrible, but the data is fairly clear at how much damage it can do. So children 
gain social maturity and emotional attachment to their parents from prenatal FPR integration. So they're meant to be wiring it in this system, shutting it down, developing it into other things. Poorly integrated fear paralysis can cause lifelong anxiety, phobias, panic disorders, and a bunch of other things. I'm, I'm trying to limit how much it actually, I'm telling you at this moment, because it's a lot. Reflexes that persist after birth will continue to hinder that child's development. It should not be there. And some of those problems that it is associated with include respiratory arrest, cardiac arrhythmias, seizure disorders. Um, this is all associated with an active fear paralysis after birth. Now, the major one that's associated is actually sudden infant death syndrome, which usually occurs at two to four months, and it could be connected. Like the literature is starting to actually blame active fear paralysis reflex and failure of myelination because of it. Now, again, known risk factors for fear paralysis reflex to actually develop panic disorder in and emotional distress in the parents, children who've had sudden infant death syndrome, C-section deliveries, and lots of stress, as well as heavy smoking or heavy amounts of passive smoking. So there's a bunch of things that we know as risk factors for this. Newborns with retained fear paralysis actually uh, react very differently to sensory and psychological cues. Now, I'm wanting you to look at this and, and start thinking about other children you might come across and other diagnoses. Uh, the triggers include restraint, inversion, which affects the vestibular system. So when they have these sensory cues, they do not respond in the way you would normally expect. They go into fear systems instead of doing airplanes with them, making it fun. Um, they are more inclined to separation disorders if they're taken away from mum or familiar in, uh, their familial environment. As the uninterrupt, uh, unintegrated fear paralysis reflex continues to exist in childhood, touch, sound, light, smell, taste, visual field shifts, all of these things, including vestibular or proprioceptive stimuli, produce hypersensitivity and defensive mechanisms in the children. Again, we might see this as tactile hypersensitivity. Children who dislike their tags or their collars and cuffs, and they find these things scary and oppressive. They can have things like rapid blood pressure drops, panic, sweating, vomit, go white with fear. They have POTS signs and symptoms. They can be shy, isolated, sad, self-conscious, and reluctant to attempt new things. They're in defense, and that they're, they're just not well emotionally regulated. And children under stress may stare incessantly without blinking, understanding only what they see right in front of them. They have tunnel vision. Ultimately though, what I'm wanting you to think about is that it starts from the mouth and the lips and it goes up and affects the eyes, it affects the vestibular system and how the brainstem will control all of their brain growth. We are not a top-down species, we are a bottom-up species. If the tongue does not develop appropriately, if it's restricted and does not move, it affects how we wire everything up. And I have another lecture on the neurological effects and how we actually wire up inappropriately from this uh, coming up uh, early next year. So again, what I've been alluding to here is that many of you will have diagnosed these children or see them and, and they'll be on the spectrum. They'll have ASD, autism, etc. What I'm, I'm wanting you to think about is, is that actually the correct diagnosis? Maybe they've actually got oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome and they're being wired up inappropriately because they don't breathe effectively, they don't use their mouth and their tongue effectively, and it has altered how their nervous system is wired up. Now, again, if the neurology of the mouth is interrupted, the control sequence for everything is going to be affected. It necessitates adaptation. You cannot go in a straight line, so you have to divert off to try and function. And we call them neurodivergent. Maybe they require a different perspective. Maybe we need to look at them from this point of view, oral airway functional maldevelopment syndrome, rather than a psychosocial aspect. The preserved FPR causes internal disharmony in all of us. It has far-reaching consequences and diversified effects. It's associated with OCD, ADHD. 
Uh, unintegrated FPRs cause heightened stress responses in everyone who's got them. It shouldn't be going on after birth. Therefore, adults and children with them will have eating disorders and sleeping disorders. If you're in vagal compromise, if you're a stage three or four um, vagal collapse, you're not going to be sleeping well, you're not going to be digesting food well. And again, um, there's a lot of uh, FPR adults that have POTS diagnosis because of their greater difficulties with maintaining blood supply going up. FPR will produce massive levels of cortisol and adrenaline. The blood moves to the organs away from the skin. Again, we get all of those signs and symptoms and we don't have good central tone in any of our musculature. So we don't move effectively to keep blood going in the right places. These people have floppy muscle tone, neck and shoulder pain really commonly. They have postural difficulties, heightened stress responses in their structure. We're all going to be seeing these people in our practices, I can guarantee you. So there's a bunch of other stuff uh, that, that I obviously don't have time to go through with you in the book First Principles. Um, what I do want you to understand that everything that we're doing in our, in our bodies is done on purpose by your brain for your survival. So the symptoms are not random. They are done on purpose and there is a pattern to them that we can look at. Again, FPR is meant to protect the fetus, but if it becomes a chronic ongoing thing, it causes harm in us and it can cause a bunch of problems, including things like dyspraxia, maladaptive breathing and sleep fragmentation is the most important ones from my point of view. Uh, again, I believe it's super important, the FPR, uh, to our human development, both in utero and especially if it's retained afterwards. It's meant to protect mum and child, but our, our life, our what's going on for us has changed. We are not living in a normal environment that we were designed for. So often we're seeing these retained reflexes. If the FPR stays active, it can cause, as I said, epigenetic alteration in the child, regardless of what's going on in mum's body. And this can cause a lifetime of impact, including tongue tie. Uh, I think it, it's essential that we're looking at mum's pre-pregnancy environment, her nutrition, her single nucleotide polymorphisms, etc., so that we can try and make our society a much happier, healthy place. Anything that we can do to actually improve mum's life and epigenetic switching could benefit both our children and our society as a whole. Um, there's a bunch more reef, uh, references in case anyone's interested. Uh, thanks very much. I hope you found it interesting. Hey, thanks, Scott. <laughs> I'll just open the floor to whoever wants to ask a question. Please just go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask away. <clears throat> Uh, Jim, go ahead. God, it's just past my bedtime and that's a lot of information to take in. Sorry. Unbelievable presentation and um, I can't, the, the living graphics you've got going there puts most of our usual slides with like inanimate diagrams <laughs> um, well, well to shame. How the hell do you do that? Um, I have a really good personal assistant. Oh, they're great. They're, they're just to have that, that uh, you know, the living slides and things, it's great. Look, I, I got about a dozen questions written down here, so I might just throw out um, a couple of the topic areas. And um, uh, so the effects of folate supplementation. Yes. Obviously, we supplement, we try and supplement the, the 300,000 pregnant women in Australia every year with folate. Yes. And that's, that's can, been clearly shown to cause an 80% reduction in neural tube defects. Yes. And I wonder if there's any data on changes in the incidence of tongue tie and all the problems that you've been speaking about tonight over the time that we've been using folate in the last 25 to 30 years. And, and also in women that take it and don't take it and what time they start it, because obviously it has to be started early in pregnancy if it's going to affect the oral problems. Absolutely. Um, so there's, there's several different forms of data. The first and foremost is that the folic acid supplementation that was originally being represented as, as the right thing to do is, as I noted, 
associated with increased risks in, in really tight frenulum, really tight oral fascia, much greater uh, coating uh, around the tongue and poorer oral function. Um, ultimately, what we're seeing from the literature is an increase in uh, diagnosis of uh, tongue tie and oral dysfunction, overbites, um, maladaptive bite structures, etc. What it's not shown to be clear is would that have been worse if we hadn't been supplementing or why we're actually specifically um, kind of going in, in a wonky direction, whether it's because we're, we're more aware of it, we've got better diagnostic criteria, we're actually starting to look at it. The, the literature doesn't tell me that at this moment in time, so I'm left guessing. Yeah, uh, which brings up some of the other things that you brought up as well. It's bound to be a range of other things, like some of the endocrine disrupting yep. chemicals that you mentioned as well. Absolutely. And, and just nutritional things and... Um, you know, hyper-processed food and all those other things that we normally It's, it's absolutely look at. to but do with that. that, that is, it, it's an interesting uh, aspect of it. And, of course, you know, both the areas of neuroanatomy there with, the, um, with all the facial development and the neural tube development will be happening at the same time. And obviously the fact that you can improve neural tube development with folate by presumably improve, improving methylation and and therefore, you know, um, having that effect. The, the, the timing of both of these events going on uh, certainly makes you think about the, the connection, doesn't it? I, I certainly agree. I, again, I think uh, a really neat thing would be to have uh, basically a, a commercial panel looking at methylation issues, MTRR, MTR, FUT2 for your B12s, etc. And having this done in, in teenagers, both male and female, early on in their life so that we actually uh, start trying to understand what their nourishment requirements for optimal outcomes are much earlier in their life and, you know, hopefully do something to start terraforming these things because we're certainly not seeing really good health outcomes in our teenagers. Like there's the a massive lift in um, you know facial disfigurement. Um, like as I said, it is the normal thing that we expect kids to end up having a plate or braces these days. And what I'm trying to look at is why are we getting there? And it's all starting in the two years prior to pregnancy. I'll, I'll just ask one more question. I've got at least half a dozen more here, but I'll, I'll let someone else ask after this. The other thing it made me think of is um, can we screen? Because you mentioned that you, you get first movements of the tongue six weeks and then you get swallowing and all of those things happening at 12 to 18 weeks. Well, we're scanning people at six to seven weeks. Most people do get a scan then. Yes. Then they get a 12-week a um screening scan and then a morphology scan at 18 weeks. So is there any research on the ability to look at like how often are these fetuses swallowing and stuff like that to give us an idea of how they might perform postnatally? Um, there isn't looking at how they perform postnatally, but there is research to show that they are doing uh, research to see what their uh, amount of swallowing, how regularly uh, issues with it uh, or not swallowing. But there's not enough to actually say uh, if they have this pattern, they are um, dysfunctional and likely to have um, issues afterwards. There's a whole lot of that um, ethics issues of intervention and we just don't have enough knowledge in around it and the literature is just not well, there. That's, yeah, that, that's the interesting thing. If you if you do screen, then what are you going to do exactly. in utero to, to prevent the problems? But I'll let someone else... Thanks, Jeff. Um, I'll just ask one more question. Um, Amy says you're better to screen the SNPs prenatally. I mean, that's related yes, to that's our question because we might know the SNPs, but in the end, how do we know and test that 
functionally the nutritional status is okay, uh, which is what we don't have. And and that is the the great thing. Uh, mm. That that seems to be the problem because again the current government status says that most women are in the appropriate age range for children are suffete with things like folate and they're not looking at, at the full gamut of, of what we're actually needing to do. I agree we should be prenatally screening and at least if, if we have evidence of a whole bunch of methylation SNPs doing something to enhance diet, potentially supplementation, um, to try and at least account for it as best as we possibly can. Yeah, because like any homocysteine and so on, and but that also necess hasn't necessarily been connected to the data to know that no. what level of homocysteine, how do you know? Because so many of our patients when we know have methylation issues, their homocysteine is normal, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and again, part of the problem is, again, I, I found the certain pieces of literature I can bring out to say, well, that TGF beta-3 and MTHFR and RAR, those are all very strongly associated. But again, to make methylation occur, if you have a B12 insufficiency, you're going to get blockaded. And so we, we've got very stuck on very certain specific pathways because we can screen for MTHFR and we know that that's got an effect. But what if the person happens to be eating a diet that's horrifically low in B3 or, you know, any of those other things it, it's why i kind of talk about that goldilocks moment we kind of need all of those things to be suffete and really exactly what jim was talking about the ultra processed food uh the pfas chemicals etc are massive uh problems for us they are disrupting um nutritional environment because you think you ate something that was healthy and again if we like in my instance i'm um celiac and i, I eat gluten free and I, I find my bread has modified tapioca starch which is an ultra processed thing although it's an organic gluten free whole meal kind of bread it's meant to be healthy and i'm still finding junk food in my supposedly wonderful food and we're all probably exposed to more uh, ultra processed malnourishing food that actually takes nutrients from our system to actually process out and has metabolic consequences that we're not actually understanding or expecting. But let's talk about what we maybe could do now. So how can we now today assess our patients for tongue tie, all of this OFMS? There are people out there doing it like, you know, Rosalba who's on the call here, other myofunctional folks. Um, so obviously I, I'm, I don't know exactly where you all are. I work with and refer to uh, different uh, airway and sleep dentists, myotherapists, ENTs, uh, and would strongly encourage people who are interested uh, to you know, find cranial chiropractors, ENTs, airway uh, people in your midst. Airway Circle Australia is a group that uh, talks a lot about this area um there's sleep people again as part of it i'm alluding more to the tongue tie and structural but again the end outcome point of fragmentation of your airway causes sleep disruption and if you disrupt your sleep you don't heal full stop and every disease that we know of has sleep fragmentation and disruption as part and parcel of its continuance if not its cause so I want people to be thinking about trying to actually improve people's sleep hygiene, trying to get airway open. If you find someone, you know, like there's Kotlow's uh, anterior tongue tie uh, tool. I think we need a an entirely new um, screening process because again, we tend to find the anterior tongue ties, but we're not finding so much of the posterior tongue ties because they're just not quite so obvious. So again, I'm just really trying to bring concepts into people's minds to say, we're not doing this very well. We all need to kind of come together and look at our patients and actually start trying to nut out how better to be screening them. Again, I think the, the SNP screening for everyone is an essential and trying to nourish ourselves uh, otherwise we need to be doing oral facial exercises we all need to be learning to take up things like the bugle or the trumpet the more 
active, meaningful activity you can do with your facial muscles. Again, things that I have my patients doing, we have this wonderful straw called a myo nozzle. And so a myo nozzle is a very specifically shaped straw designed to actually force normal suck, swallow, breathe tongue movement um, to actually drive better up and forward posture and it's shown to improve mild to moderate sleep apnea in adult patients. Um, so there's things that we need to be doing if you see someone who you think has a sleep apnea. Like again, sleep apnea is tending to be quite associated with overweightness, obesity, etc. But there's a large amount of people who are uh, normomorphic and having sleep apnea, and it will be because of shortening of their facial structure, oral orthodontics, large tongues in the mouth, too little space. And as soon as you get onto your back, you will have the tongue fall back and start including space. Now, any snoring is suspect for any reason apart from you just have an infection at that moment in time in the upper respiratory system. So assume if your patient is consistently snoring, making lip smacking noises, little pops sort of things, it's a problem and it will lead on to other harmful effects later on in life. Eddie? Yeah, I just, um, this is a really fascinating presentation, Scott. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited um, that you've put everything you know into a book for us. Um, this is something that I've been exploring for myself. Um, you know, for me, I know that growing up in water damaged buildings, created mouth breathing as a child. I've got, you know, long, narrow face, had teeth pulled out, braces, then Invisalign, and then ultimately um, in more recent years, um, issues with breathing. And um, I've seen a holistic dentist and I've had, you know, lots of other work. But in your presentation talking about where it gets set up in utero with the fascia and with the fetal um you know, reflexes in particular was quite interesting, um, you know, with maternal stress and things like that. And this is just one thread, I'm sure, of a thousand. But as anyone with like a snip in terms of COMPT, which I have, meaning catecholamines aren't metabolized that well and you're actually, you know, even draining more um, methyl donors as a result of maternal stress and then your nervous system gets wired, you can really see how easily um, that would get set up. And I've been doing a bit of work with clients in terms of neural integration and, and using NIS to clear retain reflexes in adults mm -hmm. um, and watching, you know, what a difference that makes as well. So it just, it's given me um, sparked some inspiring, you know, threads, thank you, to follow as far as that in utero development um, and I guess it really stresses the importance even further of that prenatal or preconception work because so many of those early nutrients for development up to week five and six are on board the sac not even coming through the bloodstream because the placenta is not formed yet yes um and you know i mean it's i'm sure all the practitioners here are, are aware of that but i think in terms of general public education you know a lot of people even if they're planning for a, to start a family, don't know that the 120 days prior to conception is is almost more important than you know the first five or six weeks of conception in terms of nutrient status. So, um, thank you for that. I'm going to order a copy of your book and, and dive in and, and see what other little flashes of inspiration I get. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to say anything else? We're almost at time. Nope. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. There's a few people here ready to speak. And then, um, Scott, you said that the oxygen dropping is not good, but I was just thinking, isn't even if the oxygen doesn't drop, just the fact of hypopnea oh, it, is indicating that absolutely. something. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so hypopnea is a worse than apnea. Uh, and what the, the function is shown to do is induce much more vascular damage, much more oxidative stress and chronic um, drive towards vascular dementia. So between the two, I'd rather have 
true apnea because the body is more adaptive to the true apnea than it is to the short forms of, of hypopneas. But again, like I'd be blunt uh, at this moment, I think our entire system, while I appreciate that you have to have a line in the sand that says, well, this is an apnea and this is a hypopnea, but like if you've got a nine second loss of breathing, you're a hypopnea and we don't consider that very particularly bad. Like it's only when you get to the 10 second of not breathing and longer, that's when it's a, a, a sleep apnea at that moment in time. And like I've seen patient sleep studies and the, you know, stopping breathing for on average like eight seconds, five to 10 times an hour, but we consider that not a problem because it's not apnea according to the definition. And that's gonna absolutely fry them. And again, the problem is that all of that sleep fragmentation is causing the release of catecholamines and cortisols, etc., in the system. It's causing muscle tensioning because you have to defend your airway. As soon as you go into that sort of hypoxic state, you will get clenching of the jaw and the throat. The loss of oxygen at that moment will cause an increase in acidification in the bloodstream, which will strip calcium out to drive muscle contraction. So you are going to get muscle contraction and you are going to get pain and you are going to get occipital headaches and trigger points and all of that stuff, but it's not apnea, so it's okay. We so, do the same thing with diabetes. Yes. Uh, we don't worry about insulin resistance because we've got this categorical um, cutoff. So yes. it's the same thing. We have to have a diagnostic point, you know, and we're not thinking in the continuum. No, and, and that's that's the major thing. We've got this all or nothing system and once you're in the the category then we have a drug for you a treatment for you or whatever my hope is always preventative i'd rather none of us kind of got seen for rehabilitation because we preventively looked at people and we stopped all of the future generations from having lots and lots of problems and if we can get uh, exactly uh, as Andy was saying if we can get that preconception care and again like my understanding is it's up to the two years prior to getting pregnant that makes the difference. So it's a big window um, and we just need to do different. And again, as you were saying about the, the hyperpalatable food uh, and ultra processed food, I think this is something as a, a, a community we need to be really strongly uh, focusing on and trying to drive uh, our patients and our, our greater society to be making purchase changes so that manufacturers will stop driving our food supply off a cliff. It's just horrific. It's interesting that all of what you've said ties in so beautifully to um, what most of us are thinking about the chronic disease epidemic and you mentioned the evolutionary uh, aspects as well. I mean, all of these conditions that we're seeing that are increasing frequency, you know, there's, there's, there's similar drivers all along the way. Absolutely. Okay, we'll ask you one last question, Scott, and then we'll uh, finish there. Um, Michael is asking about maxillary skeletal expansion, especially for adults in the 30 to 50 year old range. Oh, it's really That's hard. <laughs> it's hard. really, really hard. hard. Yeah. Um, I've been doing this myself. Uh, I have moved my, my maxilla forward about one millimeter in a year. Um, my, my face is not um, particularly wanting to move and I've just seen an ENT today uh, who's going to book me for septal deviation surgery so I can breathe through uh, the right side of my head so as to decrease my risk factors towards vascular dementia and I'll still continue to try and work out how to get my face to move. Um, myotherapy, orthotropics, anything that builds tone into the skeletal uh, muscles in the face and the throat is essential for this. Chewing is absolutely critical. Um, and I, I agree that expansion uh, is possible, it's just not easy. And so you've got to do it over a long period of time. It takes kind of three to five years and you've got to be consistent and regular and keep at it. 
<laughs> Rosalba is nodding. <laughs> all those nose opening smiles, all yeah. the tongue exercises. <laughs> all the... <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's so, it's so hard with the maxillary expansion. I mean, people are doing, you know, all kinds of new techniques like the dome is becoming really popular and there's been a bit of bad press about some of them and it's all I, I wish it I wish you could just recommend that adults went and did it and could tell them what direction to go down but it's just not clear is it no no, no. that's why prevention <laughs> yeah, well that that's yeah. ultimately my hope and you can work with muscles and get good results like the the studies showing that with um you know oral motor exercises um you can get a 50 percent reduction in ahi with moderate sleep apnea yes so that's pretty good so even when you can't change the structure working with the function it's definitely worth it i agree <laughs> yeah so Beautiful. On, that po- on that positive note <laughs> we'll leave it there for tonight um thanks everyone for tuning in thank you all um great to have you on Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Scott. That was that was really good. And uh, we do have requests for a part two. Thank you for watching. To learn more from Dr. Scott, visit our site at optihuman.com.au.